Mad Love with Pat's Two Cents. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard this blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. Whoo! Wow. Pat Love. Listen, I mean, this is Pat's two cents. Can you imagine people spitting in your face, slapping you, hitting you? Oh, my goodness. For, for something you didn't even do wrong saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them, that were there. This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Then he began to curse and swear saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. <laughs> and Peter remembered the words of Jesus and said unto himself, excuse me, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus which said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, this is what I want to ask you. Does your speech betray you? Hmm. When people get around you, do they know that you are one of them? One of those believers and followers of Christ. When people look at you and watch your behavior, is there something that sets you apart? Or do you blend in with the crowd? Do you camouflage yourself? Or are you automatically camouflaged by the way you carry yourself? Now, a lot of times people don't realize this. I mean, I've heard people say to me, to other people, to, I've even said to other people, there's something different about you. And it's really a good thing. Are you a born-again Christian? Are you a believer? Now, there are times I have seen people, and this is what took me so long to give my heart to the Lord. I saw people that claimed to be believers in Christ, followers of Christ. But had they not made a verbal claim, I would never have even suspected them of even knowing how to spell his name. 
So that's why I ask you, does your speech betray you? What that means in the word, it doesn't, I don't know, some people misunderstand that. But what that means is association brings on assimilation. If you hang with a bunch of seafaring uh, fishermen, you're going to talk like them. You're going to uh, speak the, the jargon, the language that goes with that field of work. If you work with a bunch of garbage collectors, you're going to speak with their jargon. If you work with bus drivers, you're going to use their jargon. If you work in the office, every field of employment has its own set of languages and phrases and terminologies and all of that because it's a it has to do with what they do on a daily basis now when you are in the streets let's say you're going to talk about things like hennessy and you got that joint uh you'll talk about catch action oh that's a honk that's a brick house you got all the little terms that go with the bar, right? You know, the bar conversation. Now, when you are in Christ, your conversation will be more around things of virtue, love, joy, peace, mercy, understanding, insight, wisdom, mm, patience, Things of good report. Things that are lovely. Things that have to do with hope and faith and belief. Things that have to do with, with encouragement and holiness and integrity. Things that have to do with helping people, with lifting people's spirits. Whatever you are speaking of, whatever you're involved in, if you're caught up, tangled up, wrapped up in, in the things of the Lord, your life is going to exude it. Your conversation is going to revolve around it. Let me give you an example. If you're dating somebody, and I, I've done it, and I know people get tired of hearing my mouth. This is when I was younger. Now, I get involved in a guy, and all they'd hear about is so-and-so this and so-and-so that, and we went to this restaurant, and oh, they had this nice outfit, and I like the way they walk, and I like the way they talk, and blah, blah, blah. Well, the person I'm enthralled with consumes my conversation, right? Who are you enthralled with? Who are you wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in? Who are you consumed by? Who's got your attention? Who's got your heart wrapped around their finger? Whatever you are into, yeah, whatever is your niche is going to occupy your conversation, the majority of your conversation. When I hung out at the nightclub, I talked about guys, I talked about catch action, I talked about sex, I talked about all the little stupid stuff they talk about at the bar. I had all the little phrases and terminologies associated with the bar. So as time goes on, people can tell by your conversation what you're about. You either are about something, you're about business, you're about volunteering. It could be a lot of things. You could be about being a designer. That's what's going to utilize most of your conversation. But when you get about the things of God, the things of the kingdom, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the workings of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the anointing of God, the things of God, the word of God, Jesus Christ himself, what God told you last night, what God did for you last week. You're not going to be talking about what your girlfriend did for you last night. 
You're going to be talking about what God did for you last night. You're going to be talking about the revelation God brought to you. What consumes your conversation? Does your speech betray you? Can people tell that you are set apart by the way you carry yourself, by the way you talk, and by your attitude? Can people tell? Will people suspect that there's something very different about you? Or do you blend in with the darkness? Mm. In artwork, for example, if you highlight, if I were to put light, if I were drawing my picture, or even doing makeup for that matter, if I put white lips on and white lids and, and white on the bone and whatever I put white on will make that part of my face look, look like it's standing out. And if I put dark and you, you use darkness to contour, you use darkness to blend. So if I use darkness right in here, it'll suck my cheeks in. Right. A lot of women do that for TV. Well, the point is, God wants you to stand out. He wants your light to shine. Purification has a whole different flavor, a whole different attitude than a person who is half-stepping, than a person who's out there playing tiddlywinks with their walk with God. So, I challenge you, if unsaved people, here's a good indication, if unsaved people are comfortable around you, if unsaved people can talk their trash and, and do their dirty, their, their dastardly deeds, let's say, and if they can uh, get high and get drunk and do whatever and cuss and talk all their little mess, and you are sitting there listening and they don't feel like shutting their mouth because you're in their circle, that's a true indication that you do not stand out. But when you are around unsaved people and they know you are there, they're aware of your presence and your speech betray you, betrayeth you, as the Bible calls it. Your speech betrays you. Your speech gives you away. It exposes you as a follower of Christ. Your behavior exposes you as a follower of Christ. What that says is they automatically curtail their tendency to curse. They automatically pull in the reins to their negative behavior because they become ashamed of how they act. They know they can talk the way they want around their other buddies that live their life. But when they get around someone who they know lives a holy life, has a holy character of integrity, that unsaved person is not going to be comfortable they will leave or they'll clean up their behavior around you just out of sheer respect. They may not want what you have or they may think they don't want what you have, but they know you got something they don't. So my challenge to you is stand out. Stand out like a sore thumb. Don't be obnoxious, but stand out. You know, I was watching, uh, now this has nothing to do with Christianity per se. This is just dealing with character. I was watching the funeral of Aretha Franklin. And one of the things everybody was just abuzz about was why was Farrakhan there and they didn't have him speak? Well, it turned out later that it was found out they had asked him to speak. But he said, I just came to celebrate 
Aretha, I don't need to be at the mic. Just let me be there in honor of her. But in his silence, in his silence, I know he's not a Christian. We're not dealing with that right now. We're dealing with character. In his silence, he spoke volumes. There are people out there that live a particular type of a life, whether they're Christian or not. They live such a high level of lifestyle, integrity, of, um, of moral standards that even that in and of itself draws respect from other people of other beliefs. And what happens is, even in their silence, they stand out like a sore thumb. So my question to you is, now you're in Christ Jesus. Do you stand out? Do you stand out like a bright light in the darkness or do you blend in with the darkness? Do you blend in with the sins of your buddies? Do you blend in with the crowd? You hang with the crowd, you talk like the crowd, like Peter did. He started cussing and talking mess. But even in him trying to do that, to take attention away from himself because he was afraid, somebody still said, nah, your speech betrays you. Your speech tells on you. Your whole mode of communication shows you up as one of them, one of those Jesus followers. What a compliment. What a compliment for someone to say, I know you've got to be a follower of God. Look at you. You are, I mean, you stand out, baby. Soon as I saw you walk in the room, I knew there was something different about you. One time, a friend of mine and I walked into a bar to pass out flyers. We were having this whole park evangelism thing, and we were going to do it via barbecue, and we were going to feed everybody that came and all that. So here we are, all the different church members were out in the community passing out flyers, and we we're doing the same. And one of the guys who saw me said, uh, he looked up, he said, is that you, Pat? And I said, yeah, how you doing, so-and-so? He said, girl, as soon as you walked in the door, you were glowing. What? Where have you been? What did you do? I said, oh, we g I gave my heart to the Lord uh, on September of blah, blah, blah. That's where you've been. It shows, girl, I see it all over you. Wow. And he just kept looking at me like, wow. Wow, girl. you Wow, look at you. Now, I don't know if that planted a seed for a future time in his life to give his heart to the Lord. I never saw him again. But I didn't even have to tell him I'm a born again Christian right away. The first thing he saw was the difference. He also heard my speech. See, I had a potty mouth back then. I cussed with the best of them, baby. Cussed like a sailor, smoked like a chimney. He saw the difference. And I wasn't standing there no more than five minutes. So, my question to you is, what do people see when they look at you? What do people hear when they hear you? Huh? Do they see bright, a bright white light? Or do they see a camouflage, camouflage clothes where you just blend it? Are you a chameleon or a Christian? <laughs> see, if you're a chameleon, you camouflage, you blend in with your surroundings. You talk like them, walk like them, dress like them, hey. Mm -hmm. Act like them, same attitude, same language, same everything. Or you jut out. You put something white, bright white, pure white, in the middle of a bunch of colorful elements. And what are you going to see? Your eyes going to be drawn to that white. 
Hmm. It's going to grab your attention. Do you grab anybody's attention? Do your words soothe anybody's soul? Are you comforting to be around? Do people just gravitate to you because of that special something, something about you? Hmm? Hmm. So, again, my question to you is, does your speech betray you? Does your speech, behavior, and carriage give you away? Tell on you that you are a follower of Christ. Or if you didn't say a word, would they not have a clue? Mm. Do you have to announce it in order for them to know? Or will their suspicions rise just by looking at you? And if people are shocked when you say you're a Christian, you better go back to the manufacturer and have a talk with him and find out if you're malfunctioning and ask him to fix you. Okay, I'm done. I hope that's a, a nice challenge for you because I'm telling you, that's one thing I got to definitely always check myself. I do not want anybody to mistake me for anything other. I don't want them to mistake me for anything because I am a born again Christian and that's the only thing I want to be identified with. What about you?